My special guest today is Les Brown, who is a legend in the speaking circuit, or just being a speaker and a beacon of light. He's written a lot of books. He's been, he has a tremendous story. Thank you. Oh, I didn't know you were introducing me then. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's all good. Listen, yeah. introducing people over Zoom is like, um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty brutal thing in general. I mean, I wish we were face to face, but the state of affairs has us over Zoom. So, yeah, we, but we can handle it. It's a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege to be here with you. you thank too. you so much for having me. And thank you for the work that you're doing, helping people to realize that we must always evolve. I mean, that is really the truth that today, if you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you're willing to learn and evolve, no one can stop you. And so that's what life is about. It's about evolving and continuously expanding our vision of ourselves and what we can do in the kind of impactful life that we can live. So it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. And how do you think you have been evolving in this last year? <laughs> I've been growing my leaps and bounds. <laughs> you know, this has been an interesting year that we just left, 2020. I'm 75 years old. February the 17th, I will be 76. And this, this past year, I learned a lot about myself in terms of when you think you've seen it all. <laughs> I feel like Mother Teresa, she said, just when I thought I got a handle on life, the handle broke. Right. <laughs> and so I've never seen anything like uh, the, the, the coronavirus. I've never seen anything like this before. I said, tell me it's a dream. I'll tell him my, my older son. I said, tell me this is a dream. He said, it's not a dream, dad, it's real. Right. <laughs> So it's, it, it's been an adventure because it allows you to rethink your life and what is it you want to do with the rest of your life. And so during this time, I've been doing a lot of reflecting. During this time, I've, I've, I finished my book because I didn't want to die with it in me. One of the things I talk about when I'm presenting to an audience, live full and die empty. Dr. Miles Monroe, who was a, a, a minister out of the Bahamas, he said, rob the cemetery of your genius, of your mm. gifts, of your inventions, of your ideas. And I was determined that I was going to rob the cemetery of my, my best work, which I feel that, that that book that I wrote was my best work, but also of my potential to have a greater impact on people. I'm always studying, I'm always reading, I believe that you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. So I learned from young guys like yourself and, and I'm, I'm always listening because you can never, you don't know how, how smart you are until you find out how much you don't know. <laughs> right. Well, one thing I got to say, one thing that you're really smart at uh, or it's perceived that you're really smart at is speaking. You know, like you're a sought after speaker. People watch your videos on YouTube. People want to hear you speak. They want to hear what you have to say. Now, I'm not sure if you view speaking as genetics, where some people are just more gifted, so they'll be a star basketball player and they're just living in their art. Or was that something that you really had to groom? Like, you know, did you come out of the womb being a great speaker? Not at all. I, I I have speakers that would, if you saw them at first, you would never believe that they would be able to stand on a stage and hold a microphone that now they have passed me because I'm a speech coach. And if any, if you're decent as a coach, everybody that you train, if they are as hungry as you are, they're going to surpass you. All of us are born the same way dumb, naked, and speechless. <laughs> <laughs> and I spoke today and I said to my audience, I, I give a motivational message on Facebook. And I said, 
if you're willing to put in the effort and the time to develop any skill, you're going to be exceptional. And this is a time where average is over, that you have to mm -hmm. manifest your greatness. And so when I used to see Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, Jim Rowan, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, Robert Schuller, I said, I want to be like them. I, I want to do what they do because I was inspired by a man who's a great communicator. I, I eulogized him, Dr. I call him Dr. Leroy Washington. He he was not a doctor, but he was a speech and drama instructor. Hey, you gave you gave him the doctorate degree because he was so good. This is a Les Brown doctorate that was given out. Yes, because he was so powerful, and I admired him. And 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 so this man, when I saw him give a, a, a presentation to some juniors in high school, I said, I want to be like this guy. Mm. And I had been in his classroom looking for a friend. And he told me, hey, young man, go to the front of the room and, and work this problem out for us. And I said, I can't do that, sir. I'm just here to see back off of Stevens. I'm not one of his students. He said, do it anyhow. And I said, I can't, sir. And I was looking down. He said, look at me. And then the other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley is smart. He's DT. And he asked, what's DT? And they said, He's the dumb twin. Mm -hmm. And I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk and he pointed at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And when he said that, that just startled me. When we speak, just like your program, the way it's designed, we distract, dispute, and inspire. Distract. How people live their lives. What, say it again. We distract. We distract, dispute, and inspire. Mm. How people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. Mm. When they listen to you speak and your guests, what you do is you interrupt their current story given to them by life, given to them by the world, given to them by their environment and their circumstances. And through the delivery of the experience that they have of your show, you dismantle their current belief system and you inspire them to make new choices with their lives. That's what we do as speakers, as life coaches, as trainers, as a, a host of a program about Evolve. Because when I listen to you, what I know is this is about me realizing that I have not done my best stuff, that life is about evolving about mm. reaching higher. It's not about settling. That the, the when I think about the, the play Lion King, Simba, you are more than that which you have become. This is what your, your show is saying when you say evolve. You are mm -hmm. more than who you are right now and what you believe. You are not your circumstances. You are not the, the things that have happened to you. You can evolve above and beyond that. And so when did you start evolving as a speaker? And did you believe, and I'm, I'm focused on speaker right now because there's a reason. So well, first of all, that that's the most important title that you could have for a show because if you're going to make it in this economy, this economy that's called the attention economy, this mm. economy that you have to be able to call attention to yourself with your story, because when people see you, if you're promoting yourself, your products, or your business, you are the storyteller. Steve Jobs said the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world. Mm. So when people see you, they're asking three questions. Who are you? What do you have? And why should I care? Mm -hmm. And so your ability to convey that when you're speaking is major. Your ability to call attention to yourself with your story and your ability to create an experience with your story as you deliver it. The reason that I was able to stand out from other speakers, when I came into the speaking industry, it was based upon two things that I shied away from based upon the advice of my mentor, Mike Williams, who wrote the book, The Road to Your Best Stuff. Number one, the Dale Carnegie course. They teach, tell them what you're going to tell them, 
tell them and then tell them what you tell them. Mike Williams taught me, Brownie, never let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience needs to hear. Mm. Conduct communications intelligence. Develop a working knowledge of what they do and why they brought you there. And what's the unspoken conversation that you need to deal with? That's number one. The next thing is, he told me to create an experience with your story. Mm. And, and, and when I came into the industry, and, and it's pretty much the same now, everyone, for the most part, was giving information from, the, from Think and Go Rich by Napoleon Hill. If information could change people, everybody would be skinny, rich, and happy. Napoleon Hill, he died broke and an alcoholic. Mm. So the information is not what it is that changed people. If you're going to transform people individually and collectively, it is very important that you learn how to use a story strategically to transform that audience to create a significant emotional event. So when I work with speakers one-on-one, -on -one, that's what I teach them how to do so that that the people individually and collectively leave their feeling better about themselves and talking about you because of that experience that you took them through as they listened to you and the stories that you shared, the examples that you provided, the information that you integrated into that presentation so that it becomes a significant emotional event. The, the speaking industry has been hijacked by people who speak to sell. Got it. I don't speak to sell. I know you don't. One thing that I'm selling you on. No, no, I'm, and I, yeah, and I know you, I know you don't. Yes. But I, I'm I keep- selling and, your greatness. So here's what, here's what I would do with you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to share something with you. My name is, is Mike. And I want you to think about something that you love, mm. something that's important to you, something that gives your life a sense of significance. And in this place where we are, the coronavirus, in this place, I want to share with you steps that I think that will be helpful to you. Number one, write this down. Master something that you love. See, most people realize that we've been trained and groomed to go get a job. A job is what you get paid for. But when you see and find something that you love, that's your calling. A calling is what you are made for. And so when you know it's your calling, it's something that you love so much, you do it for nothing, but you do it so well that people will pay you to do it. Right. The next thing is invest in yourself. They mm -hmm. asked Warren Buffett, what's the most important investment that one could make today? And here's a guy that has billions of dollars in the stock market. He has billions of dollars in real estate. And he said, the most important investment you can make is in yourself. Mm -hmm. So invest in yourself. So you're increasing your worth in the marketplace. The next thing is, in order to become successful, once you write this down, kindred spirits, you've got to get around the right people. If you don't do that, you earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. You have to look at your relationship and ask the question: Is this a positive relationship? Is this a relationship that's purposeful? That is going in the direction of where I'm going? Is this a relationship that I can learn from? That will hold me accountable? That will challenge me? And that will push me? And the next thing is expand your vision. Mm -hmm. that most people fail in life not because they aim too high and miss. Most people do what I did for years, aim too low and hit. And I'm saying to you, if you master something you love, you invest in yourself, you create caring relationships, relationships that challenge you and stretch you, you expand your vision. We call it the Mike factor. So that's all about them. Right. I think, I think, I think I'm going to get tired of it. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm with you. What I'm trying to say is you've been around a long time in, in this coaching world. I'm new. I'm brand new. I've been helping people. I'm entering into it, right? I'm trying to uh, look at what other people are doing and how does this business work? So Don't worry you, about them. Don't worry about who what cares. 
Yeah, I got what you. You got to focus on, as Henry David Thoreau said, do not go where the path may lead. Go where there's no path and leave a trail. You want to be Mike, yeah. all right? And so there are people that that when I looked at coming into this industry, I, I just could not do what the other ones were going to do. They've made millions of dollars, far more than I have, but they have not changed as many lives as I've changed. They mm. have never read as many books as I've read. They don't study and know how the human mind works. They don't know the adversity and they have not lived the life that I have lived. None of them have come from where I come. They have the complexion of connection. I have the complexion of rejection. I never mm. forget when, 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 when I saw Tony Robbins infomercial and I reached out to Guthy Rinker and those guys and say, hey, I've got a story too. And I sent them my material. And they say, hey, you got a very inspiring story, but you're black. And we don't believe America is ready for a black motivational speaker. So I, I wrote them back and said, thank you very much for reminding me that I'm black. I never would have known that if you hadn't told me. <laughs> right. <laughs> so when you come up in an environment in a culture that is designed to marginalize you, that's designed to destroy your sense of self. I remember going on Miami Beach with my mother and I was talking to my son, John Leslie, and they used to have signs up that said, Jews, dogs, and coloreds not allowed. Mm. I remember being with my mother when she went to clean some wealthy people homes and she went to look for a hat in a room directed by Ms. Harris. I'll never forget. People ask me, how'd you come up with this? You've got to be hungry. That's the title of my book. I knew the day that hunger developed in me. I heard my mother in the other room clapping her hands. And I asked her, I said, mama, why are you clapping her, your hands? And I was directed to clean the spots off the floor in the kitchen. And she said, don't you worry, Leslie. You just keep on doing what you're doing. And then she came out of the room and Ms. Harris said, did you find it, Mamie? And she said, no. She said, then look in that room down the hall on the left. And she went down there and sure enough, my mother started clapping her hands again. And I said, mama, why are you clapping your hands? And she said, didn't I tell you, pay attention to what you're doing. And Ms. Harris came over to me. I was 10 years old at the time. I'll never forget this. And she said, I can tell you why she's clapping her hands. I said, why, ma'am? She said, when I have colored people out of my vision, I can't see them and they're looking for something. I make sure they are clap their hands so that they are not stealing anything. And I dropped that washcloth and I stood up and I looked her in the eyes. Mm -hmm. And during this time, black people were not allowed to look at white people in the eyes. We always had to look down. That was the law. That was the culture that I came up in. And I said, look at me. I said, my mother is not a thief. She would not steal from you or anybody. She's a Christian. She loves you and she loves your children. And I just looked at her and she was startled because she never had a black person look her in the eyes, especially a kid or an adult. Mm -hmm. And I started scrubbing that floor and a hunger came up at me and said, this will never ever happen to my mother again. When I become a man, when I turn 18, this will never happen again. That's my mother told me. When you turn 18, son, you'll be a man. I said, when I turn 18, I'll set you down. I will work and no one will ever make you clap your hands again. And so nobody that when I came in the industry mm. ever had to go through that dehumanizing, marginalizing experience everywhere you turn it was there then and it's here now and so the 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 process of overcoming that mm. it's like if you have a wax a floor you don't just go in and put new wax on top of old wax you have to strip it so the message that i give is designed first to strip away the negative things that have been said about you, mm. the negative things that you believe about yourself, what psychologists call your self-explanatory. You know stuff. what? I think you just got me. You know what it really is? Not to play. So this is what it is. And you and you inspired this in me. Sorry to interrupt that thought. But that's okay. I think it is. I think what it is, and it so I'm gay. 
right? Mm-hmm. And um, uh, and I've looked around in this coaching world. It's this guy with his wife. Look at us. We're married. We're happy. It's like a thing, right? And I think I've always kind of felt not a part of, right? Like I've never fully felt, oh, a part of something. And as you're talking to me, what resonates with me is I just want to be a part of. And I, and I think this is my way and this is a story and this is extremely helpful actually because it just clicked for me. I'm like, I'm just feeling that same feeling that I felt before. You know what I mean? Like it just comes back at different times. Mike, first of all, there are certain things that people just don't get to weigh in on. Who in the hell gives someone the right to say, who are you sleeping with? Right. I know. Help me. You know, my, it's my, crazy. I, I have I have three people in my family that are gay. One, my son. I've never asked him, who are you sleeping with? Mm-hmm. Now, he told me. Now, had he not told me, I knew, but I would not have asked him. Because it's none of my damn business. Mm -hmm. I heard people coming out. Johnny Mathis came out. I'm gay. So am I supposed to come over and you provide some cocktails and we're going to watch? I don't get that. That's private. There's certain things that you don't get to weigh in on. That's nobody's business who you're intimate with nobody's business yeah i think I it's just no, no i think i think why it becomes an event is the pain you carry because you believe you're wrong so like when you that, finally that's the key word what you just said mm-hmm. because you believe it's wrong right because we've been taught through religion we've been taught in our culture we've taught with the conversations around us that's why Darren Benzie, he wrote a book called Most People Are Living a Misplaced Life. They're not living the life that they want to live mm. because they're allowing the opinions of others to determine how they live and how they show up. I was on a plane with a guy whose father worked with Abraham Maslow, and, and he's still around very brilliant. He was in the, he was in Auschwitz. He's in his Mm. 90s. And he did this study. Study was astounding to me. You don't hear anything about it publicly. That they did this study and that over 87% of people, of everyday people, have a propensity for being gay. Over 87%. 87%. Take, and me so, to, take me to your promised land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, so, so I said, you got to be kidding me. So I called my son. He was on the flight. I said, come up, come here. I said, Patrick, you won't believe this. <laughs> and so when, when he, he showed him and he had these statistics, if my son was about to go back to a seat, I said, thank you for coming up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Dad, I'm going to choke you out on this plane. <laughs> no. And, 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 and so this, but he, uh, that was, I am so glad that we are now living in a time where we, we are not stigmatizing stigna, people. Mm. You think of some of the brilliant people like James Bowen, like Oscar Wilde. I mean, brilliant minds, mm. brilliant people that were stigmatized. Um, some were beaten to death and tortured to death. In, 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 in Nigeria, they just about four years ago, they were killing people who were discovered and or they expressed their sexual presence. They killed them because some stupid evangelists from America went over there and said, this is wrong. And they hung them. Mm. So we are, we're coming in a time of where we are evolving. Right. <laughs> we are evolving to, to, 
not be judgmental. To judge not according to appearances because your preference is different than mine does not make you a bad person. Yeah, it, it is It is so interesting how um, judgment is such a part of like culture when really it's like, who are you judging? Like, what? it's such a waste of energy time, but it also put, historically, I mean, I, I got to imagine when you were speaking and being black and being different and getting rejected from people because you weren't what they were looking for. But the fact that you pushed through and you built a, an iconic life, you know, a life that you love, you know, even talking to you now, you feel full of life. You feel like you're learning, you're excited, you're inspired, you know? Yes, I live a, it is great to be me. <laughs> so when does it, when's, when's your book coming out? It's out already. You can get it on Amazon. It's called, You've Got to Be Hungry, The Greatness Within to Win. Talk to me about it. It's about the people who are going to make it. Just what you just talked about. The people that are going to live life on their terms, not survive. What it takes to live and what it takes to survive are two different things. The people that are going to make it and come through and break through all odds are people who are hungry. People that are hungry are relentless. People mm -hmm. who are hungry are self-definitional. People who are hungry don't allow their circumstances or their environment to determine who you are. You decided that I'm going to be transparent. That's risky. This God said, if you're not willing to risk, you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you can't become your best. And if mm. you can't become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? So you decided, I'm coming out of hiding. I'm going to be my authentic self. And whoever likes it or don't like it, so be it. It's none of my spiritual business. Mm. And so being hungry is, this book is for people who've also lost the hunger a bit? I, I don't think people lose their hunger. I don't think so. If you're doing the work that you're supposed to do, you will die doing it. Once mm. you know what it is, you will die doing what it. What was a pivot for you when you, you were doing it and then you went, all right, I'm pivoting that. Like what was like a moment for you in your career where you just pivoted the hunger? And when I said I was gonna do this? No, just like while you've been doing this for many years, when have you pivoted and said, okay, I'm taking a pivot this way though in this uh, purpose that I have. I'm not gonna keep doing this. I haven't. You haven't. You've been consistent. Man, I'm. I've been doing this for longer than you've been on the planet. I've been I know. Doing this for fifty-two years. How old are you? Forty-one. I've got t-shirts older than you. Tennis shoes older than you. I'm seventy-six. Five. I'm you living my you making. You didn't, you didn't turn seventy-six yet. Uh, 76 on February the 17th. That will be the consummation of it. Yes. <laughs> but see, a job is what you get paid for. Your calling is what you're made for. Mm. And, and when you are living your making, God's life is God's gift to us. And how we live our lives is our gift to God. And you can't live your life if you're not authentic, if you're not true to yourself. And, and you've decided to take a stand with your mm -hmm. life. It could have cost you your job. It could have cost you listeners, but you decided, so be it. This is who I am. Mm. You, and, and you know that life is a, it's a fight. It's a fight for territory to live your authentic life. Life mm -hmm. is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. The bigots. Say that again. Life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, to be your authentic self, yeah. to be real, to be you, to live from a place of integrity. Once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. Living a lie 
being concerned about what people think. Mm. I don't give a fat rat's behind what people think about me. And you've been like that for the past 50 years? 76. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it really started in my junior year in high school because when I was in the fifth grade, I was put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade and I was labeled educable mental retarded. Mm. And then I fell in the eighth grade and then I met this high school teacher in the 11th year of high school, my junior year. And he told me when kids were calling me DT, the dumb twin, I have a twin brother and I answered them and he asked, what's DT? I said, dumb twin. He said, don't you ever answer to that again. And, and so what he said was someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. So he interrupted my thinking. And from that point on, I never cared what people thought about me, period. Mm. You made a commitment and a decision and changed the story. Absolutely. To myself, that's the most important story. The one that what Les Brown says, as Michael Jackson would say, to the man in the mirror, mm. what he says to himself. That's why most people are not living like you. Most people go through life, as Henry David Thoreau said, they go through life in quiet desperation, mm. hoping that nobody ever finds out. There's a book that I read once, and the title of it was, Why I'm Afraid to Tell You Who I Am, Because You Might Not Like Me, and That's All I've Got. Mm. You never had a guest like me. Come on, bring it. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Pray it. No, I think that's the challenge for, for a lot of people that I work with and our audience is not feeling good enough and wanting to hide out in the shadows. And, I, and quiet desperation is sums up a lot of what I see and I experience with people, you know. I think um, this is helpful for me. I also, I'm curious, though. I am curious, like, to have you, do you have a group of people that you train and mentor or what does it look like? People call and they email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com. That's my personal email. Seven is my lucky number. I'm one of seven children. I, I am on February the 17th. That's my birthday. Sevens are all around me. And Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. Naaman dipped himself in the River Jordan seven times. Did I tell you seven is my lucky number? Seven's the number. Yes. That's so they right. just email you, and then what does that look like? What do you? Is it? Is are they like group calls? Are they one on one? Like no, no, they they're group calls now. I don't see anybody personally. They're virtual. I do group calls, and I do do one on one calls. People who are interested in one on one coaching with me. They email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com and say, I want you to train me how to speak. How that to is, and, and that's what you love to do is audience. train, you love to train people how to speak. Yes, because we need more voices. We need more voices outside of religion mm. where they teach you how to live after you die, outside of politics. Give me your vote. And, and I'll represent your interests. I teach people how to live right here, right now, and how to be focused on your life. Not focus on what goes on in the White House, focus on what's going on in your house and how to live right here, right now. So Les, will you join our empowerment group on two? Will you speak at one of them? Absolutely. All right, awesome. I'll, I'll send you details. It's at 5 p.m. It's a great group. We've been doing it ever since COVID started. Um, and this is this is exactly what everyone's hungry for, you know, is is I, your wisdom, your experience, your love, your passion. And um, I really appreciate you coming on Always Evolving and Evolving with us. Oh, yeah. And, and um you know, if everyone wants to check out more about Les Brown, uh, he gave you his email. So that's always a great spot. Also, if they'd like to see me speaking in action, tell them to go on YouTube 
and put in Les Brown speaking in the Georgia Dome. They'll see me speaking before 80,000 people. Les Brown speaking in the Georgia Dome. Was that, that must have been amazing, huh? Yes. It's so f amazing. I was so frightened. I don't even remember giving the speech. How many, how the heck did 80,000 people show? What was the event? It was a, a gathering of entrepreneurs. A guy named Dexter Yeager wanted to have the largest gathering of entrepreneurs to go into the Guinness Book of Records. And he selected me to be one of the speakers. Wow. And then lesbrown.com is your website, right? Yes, right. Okay. And if they're, if they, yes, and if they, and if they want to reach me, it's, it's, it's uh, lesbrown77 at gmail.com. We have groups training and one-on-one -on -one training all done all right. virtually amazing all right les well thanks for coming on always evolving appreciate you being with us thank you darling thank you miss thing <laughs> <laughs> i love you <laughs>